Jerry, video games are the latest craze to sweep the country and most of the world, too. Millions of people are addicted to hours of gazing at electronic images on game screens and arcades and in their own homes. For the longest time, video games have been destroying the youth of our nations. Several games stand out when looking back at the most controversial games such as Mortal Kombat, Night Trap and Grand Theft Auto, but they all played their part in angering parental groups and of course this did nothing but help boost sales. Now, as time moves on, plenty of these gore-filled games get very much watered down by whatever game comes next. However, some games are so controversial that even by today's standards, it's pretty easy to see why so many people kicked off. And on today's episode, I plan to look back at NARC. The most over-the-top, drug-filled, limb-filled, and most importantly, digitized, graphic-filled arcade games ever released. A game that in more recent years has found itself a new lease of life due to its absolutely obscure over-the-top nature that's still brilliantly funny to experience for newcomers today and is 100% deserving of every single Karen's attention. But of course, this is just the icing on the cake. So let's go back to the beginning and check out the company's history of NARC, where we'll be looking at its creation, its overly obscure themes, its even more gruesome inspiration, its forgettable sequel, and of course, its games. This is the complete history of NARC. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. Hey guys, I just want to say a massive thanks for you guys to actually click on this video and watch it. I love making these videos. I just want to say a big, big thanks. Please do hit that subscribe button and the notification bell if you want to be notified on when future videos like these are uploaded. And if you want to support the show and see videos like these early, including the next four or five kick scammer videos before they go public, you can do so by becoming a Patreon or YouTube member. Or if you want to support the show and buy video games at the same time, there'll be a Play Asia link in that top comment with my suggested game of the week. Anyway, let's carry on with the video. Our story starts back in California in the 70s. A young Eugene Jarvis had just attended a seminar at his high school held by local IT company IBM to teach kids the importance of coding. He and his classmates would write down some Fortran code onto some paper themselves and then hand it in. It was basic, but it grabbed his attention and then some. He would eventually continue down this programming path, moving to college, learning to program on punch cards, and more importantly for this episode, spending way, way, way too much of his free time in the basement of his physics building, where he discovered and played the hell out of arguably the first ever proper video game released, Space War. Never had anything managed to captivate him quite as much as this. Turning up at midnight when almost nobody was around, and because of the closed off walls and neglection of sunlight, the boys would often lose track of time, not realizing that it's already the following day as they make a mad dash for the first class. Eugene became addicted to video games before the term video games was even coined. And when he wasn't in the physics labs playing on Space Wars, he would often be found at pinball halls, which were very common around American campuses towards the late 70s. Of course, at the time before video games were really a thing, these places were quite high on the corruption of Americans' youth list, which did nothing but raise awareness of these establishments and it made people like Eugene like them even more. Eventually, this led him to get a job at Atari, by far the most prestigious company for the time in this arena, which was not only making games but was even looking at moving into the pinball business too. And his first job at Atari was to work on Atari's first ever pinball machine, cleverly titled The Atarians. 
The project very much just fell into his lap after being assigned to work on it. Several key members from the team left the company. Eugene, the new guy, was basically the one left in charge. The Atarians wasn't the most well-made or even well-loved machine, far from it, but it helped Eugene continue on the pinball path. After a few more tables eventually with his new friend Steve Ritchie, they would leave the Californian-based video game giants and move to Chicago to work with the pinball giants themselves, Williams. Now, of course, with the rise of arcade machines, most notably machines like Space Invaders, it was very obvious that these were going to be the next big thing. They had a quicker turnaround of punters, they took up less space, and there was always a queue to play on these new arcade machines. No longer are Space Invader machines found only in amusement arcades. Cinemas now want their share of the attraction. The pinball scene wasn't exactly dead, but the arcade scene was seriously thriving. Williams didn't do too well with their first attempt in this field, which was nothing more than a Pong clone. So they decided to give Eugene a chance at making a new game, and the end result was Defender. A game so popular that after its rather slow start, it eventually ended up netting the company well over a billion dollars in profit. And Eugene had just proven himself as a bit of a wizard in these fields. Not only had he conquered the pinball world, but he had now just conquered the arcade world too. Stargate was soon followed after this, and then you had Robotron 2084, which as stated before on the Complete History Show, became the origin of the Smash TV games, but before that, it actually got a sequel of its own, titled Blaster, which although was incredibly impressive for the time, actually ended up being quite a flop for the company. Very few machines were made, and the ones that did were pretty disastrous, with the not-so-appealing plastic cover strangely shrinking after only a few months, resulting in some arcade owners claiming that the screen would burst out of the cabinet across the floor, or even worse, onto the punters. And the other reason as to why this particular machine didn't do all of that well was simply, just like the pinball craze before it, arcade machines were just not doing that well at the time. You had Japanese jammer kits flooding the market, you had home computers pulling interest away, and of course, you had the video game crash of 1983, which just so happens to have been the same year as this game's release. Not only did this result in several home versions never originally seeing the light of day, but it was indeed the final nail in the coffin for the Williams Gaming Division, and as a result, they decided to refocus all of their efforts onto what they knew best, the pinball machines. That was until the winter of 1986, where Eugene returned and proposed a reboot of that video game sector, using a, for the time, incredibly powerful high-resolution hardware system. The plan was to create the first ever arcade game using Texas Instruments TMS 34010's 32-bit chip in order to give the game photorealistic digitized graphics, something that eventual Mortal Kombat adopters would become very attached to. Thankfully for him, Williams was once again on a roll after the success of their recently released pinball cabinet, High Speed. The timing was just perfect, and the hardware was intriguing, so the boys got to work on the two-year project that was NARC. The development started by sussing out the ins and outs of this new Texas Instruments chip alongside AT&T's TrueVision Advanced Raster Graphics Adapter, or Targa for short. They were able to write their own live-action imaging capturing software using these components. They would dress up actors in brightly coloured costumes and make up against opposing coloured backdrops as close to the camera as possible in order to get the best resolution possible, and consistently doing this over and over again until they got the best looking loop cycles that were achievable by the actors. Of course, to do this, treadmills were used in this instance, and trained pit bull dogs were brought in too, as well as plenty of other made up tricks that helped the characters have that extra pop out effect that they were going for, including adding flour to the denim jeans to help add definition and oil to leather jackets to help them shine. Eugene was desperate to copy the art style of the action movies he loves, such as Lethal Weapon, and even though they weren't 
weren't the first to use digitized sprites. After all, they were used very crudely in the 1983 Journey arcade game. But for the time, they did what they could, and in my opinion, they definitely pulled it off. You're, you're busted. You're, you're busted. Nark was eventually released in 1988, a run and gun game where you control Max Force and Hitman, who had received a memo from Spencer Williams, the Narcotics Opposition Chairman in Washington, D.C., with orders to take down Mr. Big, the head of an underground drug trafficking and terrorist organization. In other words, he's the bad guy. It was all completely crazy for the time, but the end results speak for themselves. Eugene had built up so much trust within Williams that they gave his team almost complete free reign to do whatever they wanted, which in hindsight, after experiencing a game like NARC and casting your mind back to the late 80s, was a seriously risky move. Of course, the game was ultra-violent, a surrealistic nightmare according to some of Williams' board members, and because of this, it almost got shut down, but just like Eugene's previous work, such as Defender, which was also questioned during development, Williams rightfully let him and his team continue on with this project. The way the team saw it is that it's whatever you wanted it to be. If you're looking for this to be encouraging to younger children with its hardcore drug-filled ways that were going to do nothing but harm the youth of the 80s, then there was no changing that mindset. If you instead saw it for what it was, a firework-filled explosion of satire that actually rewards players more for arresting drug dealers rather than shooting them, and is so over the top that it borders on stupidity rather than any kind of realism, then of course, not only are you going to see it like that, but you're probably going to be living a far more chilled out and happier life too. The inspiration for Narc's actual theme, of course, came from several places. Eugene himself wanted to not only cause controversy upon the game's release, because let's be honest, that always helps, and not only did he want to create a game that looked like you was playing a real action flick, with 48 hours being another major inspiration to its colour scheme, but at the end of the day, drugs, sex and violence was always going to be the central theme. Eugene was very connected into this world, not because it's what he dabbled in himself, but as a young lad growing up through the weed-smoking days of the 70s into the 80s, having friends, family and co-workers lose their lives to the more hardcore substances that grew in popularity, the theme to Narc was actually quite meaningful to him. We're keeping in shape, but it's important to me to be the best that I can be and look the best that I can look. I don't go through all this to impress other people. I do it because I care about me. I care about my body and my health, but most importantly, I care about feeling good about myself. That's why I would never, ever take illegal drugs. You know, I've seen some people who smoke marijuana, and they seem to lose pride in their appearance. They lose their motivation to achieve. And let's face it, what goes in your body eventually shows up on the outside. The bottom line is stay away from drugs, but do it because you care about yourself. America as a whole was right in the heart of its war on drugs, with crime on the rise and the number of arrests related to drugs shooting up by 126% during that decade. There simply just was no getting away from it. This, of course, helped raise awareness to a game such as Narc that not only found your hero shooting away and arresting drug dealers left, right and centre, but it was also one of the first, if not the first game to ever feature the winners Say No to Drugs Splash screen that arcade goers were very familiar with at the time. And finally, one piece of inspiration for Narc that everybody seems to forget about or not bring up for whatever reason is the inspiration behind the characters themselves. 
Most notably, Kinky Pinky, the clown serial killer designed by lead artist Jack Hager. Now a lot of classic video game characters are inspired by real world people and this one right here is no different. Kinky Pinky was inspired by John Wayne Gacy, the American serial killer and sex offender better known by the media as the Killer Clown, who assaulted and murdered at least 33 young men and boys and used his side hustle dressing up as a clown at kids' parties as a way to lure them into his house in order to commit these crimes. Anyway, the game did mildly well, well enough to be a success at least, and arcade owners were massive fans. The more parents complaining about the game, the more kids wanted to play it, and even though only an estimated 3,750 cabinets were produced, the centers that had these machines always had the biggest lines attached to them. The game was hard, it was a pure coin gobbler designed for arcade goers by hardcore gamers that tried their best to kill you in the most gruesome and experimental ways that they could think of, making you want to drop just a few more of your parents' hard-earned coinage in to not only get further than the last guy, but to see how you're going to be dying next. On top of that, the game has fully stood the test of time, in more recent years getting plenty of interest from YouTubers attracted to its absolutely absurd and comically gruesome characters and, of course, the bosses. It's a fun game, a little stiff by today's standards, but it's a game well worth playing that still gives off the same laughs as it did back then, and due to its ever-increasing rise and all of its word-of-mouth popularity, it eventually gained itself a whole heap of ports. The most notable port, of course, was the NES, which was ported by Rare. <laughs> yes, that Rare. Sadly, it's not all that good. Alright, it's okay, it plays pretty well, and due to Nintendo's strict family-friendly nature, all of the narcotics references were removed from the game. Thankfully, the majority of the action is still intact, and as ports go, it's kinda worth playing. That is if you don't have the Commodore 64 port to hand, which is arguably the best of the home conversions, the rest are either unplayable or just completely pointless. And that was the end of NARC until 2005. Sure, we got ourselves a few ports on random compilations of this game, but you know what else we got three years prior to this date? Grand Theft Auto 3. Grand Theft Auto 3 was a big, big deal. Very few games came along that change up the gaming landscape almost completely, but GTA 3 was definitely one of those games. To this day, people stop what they're doing for new information regarding a new entry in the GTA franchise, mostly because the games are great. So great that a mass amount of copycats followed suit, and of course, NARC was no different. It's your typical fair and open world game where you beat up bad guys, chat to this person, move on, beat up more bad guys, and so on. The big M for Mature Sticker is here due to the game's rather hefty use of drugs, but even upon release, this game was a budget title. Where do they get it? How are they moving it? Agent Frasensky, NARC Squad. The DEA is forcing themselves on this. Your old partner, Marcus, is the lead agent. This is our case. Don't move in until I give the word. Yeah, right. He's going for the gun! Police, free! Some moments I was an addict. But this moment, I'm a cop. Two cops on the street face a choice. Do they walk the line, or do they cross it? NARC, 1995. Big hit, friend prices. Rated M for mature. In the game, you get the choice to beat off from the typical path and bust bad guys to take their contraband. You can then use these drugs and get closer to the promotion. You can sell the drugs yourself in order to get money for more guns. Or, and this is the best of all, actually, you can take the drugs yourself for momentary power-ups like bullet time or super fast speed. The soundtrack itself is a generic mix of hip-hop, reggae, and funk licensed tracks. They're very good tracks, just very standard. The world looks looks incredibly bland, dark and forgettable, and the game is, well, like I said, it's just very, very bland, dark and forgettable. Oh, 
As stated, it was a budget game on release and the scores reflect that. It was a poor example of a game trying to do what the big boys were doing at half the price, resulting in half the fun and half the scores across the board. It's a shame that this was how the name of Narc has been left, but thankfully the game truly is just so forgettable that most people don't even class it as a proper part of the series anyway. The real important and really only important part of this history is the original game. A game that although is a little rough around the edges, not only shocked the world and gave young gamers the most extreme getaway that they ever got, but it also reinvented the video game division of a once pinball-only company who, just like everybody else, were fighting back after the devastating blow to the American video game crash. And for Eugene, it reinvigorated his interest in game development as his first attempt from the golden age of gaming into the gritty underbelly of the 80s and 90s with, of course, Smash TV. I get angry just thinking about it makes me mad. Little kids doing drugs, it turns my stomach. That stuff hurts. It stops you from living up to your potential. It holds you back. It hurts the user. It hurts his family. And it hurts his friends. I just want to shake some sense into you kids that are using drugs and think about using it. So remember, don't or else. Okay? Hey there guys, thank you for checking out the video. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed looking into the history of NARC. Uh, you don't expect a game with so few entries to have so much awesome history and that's why I love making these videos. So thank you all so much for supporting the show and allowing me to make these types of videos. As stated at the beginning, uh, there's a PlayAsia link down below if you want to support the channel that way or obviously if you want to see several kick scammer videos before they go live, you can do so on Patreon or as a YouTube member, those links will also be down below so thank you all so much for your support with an extra big shout out going to sorry it's so early in the morning going to aaron gorman andrew dalton arista benjamin guy big rico bram perez brandon gold cheshire one krista shapeshifter christopher deveo clan bob kobo 4747 conrad constantine cromilla to action saxon dalton aka chev matic uh daniel terrares uh, uh darren watson dina dina 81 dig zb dominic devonport francisco courts gabriel coat uh Mace moi sescu uh game apologist gary pinkett harvey 2478 hmm intrigued gaming j is man child jabba al aden jacob p aka avalon james james jeremy rodriguez jonathan hayward josh gibbons king link reviews lucas gates lucas soft tail lips man of god 9000 uh, man shovel matt Jackson, Michael Ridley Dash, Michael Towns, Mike Fallon, Mind of the Unsane, Nerdy Simmer, Tatty, uh, Nicholas Burtner, Nick Pollard, Nightwill, Pretendo 64, Roll VP, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, Richard Aldegic, Rocket Plod, Roven Army, Ryan Holt, Samuel Nielsen, Shade Silence, Shadow Dragon, uh, Solix Captor, Steven, Taylor Rainwater, That Gamer, The Cun English, The Shaded J, Tim LaBonte, Tim Lunn, Trans Rights, Vike Echo, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, and Ye Old Hamburglar. Like I said, all of these people, all of the people you're seeing at the bottom of the screen right now are huge supporters of the show, and it's because of these guys that I'm able to create the videos that you've just watched, and these particular people are able to see the next several Kick Scammer exclusive episodes before they go live it's like five four five episodes before they go live currently so yeah thank you all so so much for your support i hope you enjoyed the video please hit that subscribe button if you haven't already but until next time guys this is dj slope signing out and hopefully i'll see you all next time bye bye